Thank you, Tom, um, and welcome again to all uh, here in this uh, great uh, symposium. Uh, it's great to see you all. Um, we would like to move to the next uh, uh, session, which will be dedicated to the Guillain-Barre syndrome, the many research projects that we have done uh, collectively. Um, and I first would like to introduce to you uh, Sonia Leonard. Uh, she's a student um, at Erasmus MC in Rotterdam, uh, the Netherlands, uh, and she's about to finish her thesis on the association between Zika and the Guillain-Barre syndrome and uh, with other infections and especially pandemics. And without further ado, Sonia, can you give your lecture? Hi, everybody. Um, let me just share my screen. Hi, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be invited to talk here um, to you about uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome uh, in relation to Zika virus and also in relation to other pandemics. Um, so uh, I realize that many of you on the webinar now may not be neurologists and some of you may not know what Guillain-Barre syndrome or GBS is. Um, so GBS is a severe neurological condition that can cause paralysis and it is caused by inflammation of the peripheral nerves. It's a rare disease which occurs in about one to two per 100,000 person years, and it can be triggered by infections. Um, about 20% of GBS patients are admitted to the intensive care unit because of involvement of the respiratory tract um, uh, muscles, and uh, two to 12% of GBS patients die, depending on the care available, uh, which is mostly due to um, complications at the ICU, such as pneumonia or involvement of the autonomic nervous system. So um, GBS has been associated in previous studies with different types of infection. Uh, the five infections listed on this slide have been associated with GBS in case control study. And the most important one is uh, the Campylobacter jejuni infection, which uh, causes a gastrointestinal infection, it's a bacterium that occurs in about 30% of GBS patients. Um, so before talking to you about the relation between Zika virus and GBS, I wanted to take you back to the timeline of the Zika virus pandemic. Um, so Zika virus was first discovered in 1947 in the Zika, Zika forest in Uganda. And this is why the virus is called Zika. And then in the next about 60 years, nothing really happened. So it didn't cause any outbreaks. That only happened in 2007 on the Yap Island in Micronesia. And then again, six years later, on the island of French Polynesia in 2013. But many of you will first have heard of Zika uh, during the big pandemic, of course, in Brazil in early 2015 that then spread to other countries in Latin America and also across the world. But even during the French Polynesia outbreak in 2013, a relation with uh, occurrence of GBS was found. So in this publication in The Lancet, you can see in the orange bars, the number of Zika cases, and in the red bars, the number of GBS cases. So you can clearly see that a rise in GBS cases was found during this first um, or one of these first outbreaks of Zika virus. And during the pandemic in Latin America, similar, similar findings have been, have been found. So here's a, a study that's uh, of seven countries in Latin America, also showing in the yellow bars, the Zika, uh, the GBS patients um, that uh, increase during the, the Zika virus outbreak that is shown in the green bars. Um, and in total, uh, a temporal association between a Zika virus uh, incidence increase and a GBS incidence increase has been found in 23 countries. And evidence of an association has been found in at least uh, seven case control studies across six different countries. And the risk of, of getting GBS after a Zika virus infection has been estimated at two GBS cases per 10,000 Zika virus cases, which is about 10 times as high as the normal incidence of, of GBS. Um, so the, the reason that, uh, that I or we at Erasmus MC got involved 
in researching uh, the relation between GBS and Zika is because of IGOLS, the International GBS Outcome Study. So this is um, the largest uh, ongoing cohort study on Guillain-Barre syndrome, which was set up by Professor Jacobs uh, in 2012. And um, over the past years, more than 160 hospitals have participated in the study across 22 countries and about 2000 uh, GBS patients have been included. So we were asked if we can use the if we could use the infrastructure of IGOS to also um, uh, research the relation between Zika and GBS. Um, so this is what we did. Uh, we have shared the protocol of IGOS with several other research groups that were involved in studying the relation between Zika and GBS, including the NIAS group in Colombia and Sing Health in um, several countries in Southeast Asia. And we also uh, set up a case control study uh, that was based on IGOS and was specifically developed to study the relation between Zika and GBS, which was called IGOS Zika and has been operative in several uh, cities across Brazil, um, Argentina and Malaysia. So I wanted to highlight a few of the projects that we were involved in. Um, and the first one is the project that was set up by um, Dr. Lucia Brito, who, was, who just gave a talk. And this was a study that she set up with her group in her, in her hospital in Recife in Northeast Brazil. You can see on the map uh, the little red uh, um, uh, uh, state, that is uh, the Pernambuco state where Recife is. Um, and, sh and she found that in the, um, the end of uh, December 2014, an increase in the amount of GBS cases was found, uh, and also uh, in 2015 and 16. And during these times, of course, the Zika epidemic occurred, but also chikungunya epidemic, as you can see uh, in this figure. Um, and uh, so she set up the cohort study, including all GBS cases that had preceding uh, symptoms of an arbovirus infection. And in total, 71 cases were included, um, and 48 of them, so 68%, had evidence of a recent arbovirus infection. Um, most of them had Zika virus infection, but also 11% had a chikungunya infection, and 20% had um, both evidence of a Zika and chikungunya infection, which is, of course, a very interesting finding. Um, all, most of these patients had a classic type of GBS because there are several different phenotypes of, this, of the disease. But these patients had a classic variant, which is the sensory motor, the myelinating variant of GBS. And interestingly, we found that the disease course in patients with evidence of both the Zika and a chikungunya infection um, was worse. Um, we also wanted to look at, um, this is something that uh, um, was already highlighted just now in the, in the conversation, but we also wanted to look at what has been found uh, in relation to GBS related to Zika in other publications. So we did a systematic review and meta-analysis of all the studies that have been published on GBS cases in relation to Zika virus. And in this study, we included 35 studies reporting on more than 600 GBS patients. And what we found was most of these patients had uh, the, the time between infectious and neurological symptoms was uh, the median was between five and 12 days, which is an important finding because in the beginning of the Zika virus epidemic, it was thought that maybe Zika virus related GBS was very different from the classic type of GBS or from GBS related to other infections uh, because the time uh, between the onset of infectious symptoms or symptoms of Zika virus infection was uh, shorter than was expected based on other uh, cases of GPS. Um, and so short that it was thought that maybe it was due to a direct infection and not a classic post-infectious disease. However, in this study, we found that this time, so about a week in most cases, is actually um, more fitting with a post-infectious disease mechanism and also very similar to uh, GBS after other types of infection. And again, we found uh, that most cases had a sensory motor demyelinating variant of GBS, so a classic type of GBS. Um, and uh, as, as already highlighted, we found a high rate of ICU admission, about, about 
and mechanical ventilation, which is higher than expected based on previous literature on GBS after other infections. Um, and the third study I wanted to highlight is that because, so we knew that there was an increase in GBS cases during the Zika virus pandemic in Brazil, but we did not yet know what the impact of that was on the management of GBS. So we did a survey study amongst all uh, uh, neurologists working in Brazil and uh, eventually 171 neurologists participated in the study. Um, and we asked them what the most important limitations were in managing GPS. And so 60% um, of neurologists indicated that they found any limitation in the uh, performance of nerve conduction studies. 55% had some problems in referring patients to the ICU and 30% had problems referring patients to rehabilitation units. Furthermore, most neurologists did not use a protocol to treat GBS, which makes sense because at that time there was no um, national guideline for GBS treatment or management. And also the treatment practice varied. So also based on this study, um, uh, we uh, got together with a big group of international GBS experts to make an international consensus guideline because not only was there no national guideline for GBS in Brazil, but there was also no international guideline for the diagnosis and treatment of GBS. So we got together with a large group of people from different countries across the world, as you can see in purple on the map. Um, and we made a simple guideline, which has a, which has a 10 steps approach uh, that was also um, developed to be able to be applicable in all different health settings. Um, and to uh, improve the dissemination of these guidelines, we also made a translation to Portuguese, which was um, published in a national Brazilian journal and are preparing uh, translations to Spanish and Chinese as well. Furthermore, we collaborated with Ready and the Global Health Network to also make an online tool, which is accessible to everybody uh, based on these uh, 10 steps guideline. So, um, as I said in the beginning of the presentation, I was going to talk not only about Zika, but also about other epidemics, because Zika is not the first epidemic of an infectious disease associated with outbreaks of GBS. Uh, these are all different and the timeline, different outbreaks of GBS and the relation with the, the different pathogens. And it's probably also not going to be the last outbreak related to um, um, less GBS outbreak. So um, one of the examples of this is that in 2019, there was a huge outbreak of GBS in Peru, so big that they even declared it a health emergency. Um, and as you can see on this figure, you can understand why they call it a health emergency, because in the blue line, you can see the number of GBS cases in 2018, and in the orange line, the, the number of cases in 2019. So this was a, a huge increase. And of course, initially, it was thought that this might be due to Zika, uh, because uh, it was at the end of the, of the epidemic of Zika and in the Latin American country. But in collaboration with a neurologist from from Peru, Dr. Ramos, uh, we actually discovered that it was not due to Zika or other arboviruses, but due to the, the bacterium Campylobacter jejuni. And now, of course, we're in a new pandemic, COVID-19, and uh, already uh, several cases uh, have been reported in case series and small cohort studies that suggest that there might be a relation between SARS-CoV-2 and GBS. Um, Recently, however, a study from the UK, an epidemiological study, finds no association between COVID-19 and GBS, and even found that the number of GBS cases decreased during the, the COVID-19 outbreak or pandemic, I must say. And Dr. Willison also uh, highlighted that we, were, uh, we are also investigating this currently in the IGOL study. Um, and here we we find, we find uh, that there are some GBS cases with, uh, with recent COVID-19 infection, but we're not sure if this is really, um, if this is really a, an association or a coincidental finding. Um, 
So I want to conclude with um, a slide that highlights the legacy of CICA plan. So CICA plan has enabled us to increase our understanding of the association between Zika virus and other arboviruses in GBS, and also the impact of arboviruses on the management of GBS across the world. We've been able to increase our international network of research groups and enhance our response to future outbreaks. And we have been able to make an international clinical guideline for GBS and online tools to help um, clinicians all around the world to diagnose and manage these, pa these patients in a good way. Um, so here I want to end with my most important slide. Everything that I just talked about was work that was done with huge groups of people. And um, I want to thank them very much for a great collaboration in the past years. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. I'll clap on everybody's behalf. Okay. Th thank you, Sonia. This was a very clear presentation and a good overview on all the research that has been done. Uh, thank you as well for the hard work and with you also the other people that, uh, that supported you uh, and collaborated in these, uh, uh, these studies. Um, I'm not sure if the chat function is uh, working really well, uh, but are there any questions for Sonia? I uh, can, can ask a question um, about uh, the Sonia, the, the, the study from Peru, um, how, you know, a lot, a lot of this program is about sort of uh, networks and preparing for the future. Um, although uh, it turned out not to be Zika, it turned out to be Campylobacter. Did you, were there any kind of benefits from having the, the network involvement from, from, you know, did Zika plan contribute in any way, laying any of the groundwork for that kind of study? Yes, I, I think so. Um, so uh, Dr. Ramos, I think initially contacted um, Dr. Pardo, uh, who uh, it was part of the, uh, amongst others of the NIAS group that was investigating the neurological complications of the arbovirus infections uh, in, in Colombia. And as far as I know, we were not collaborating yet with, with Dr. Pardo before the Zika plan started, uh, because we were all part of Zika plan. Um, so we were very quickly, we could sort of link to each other and help each other uh, in connecting um, the right people really to, to investigate this in a, in a quick way. So I think that especially sort of the connectivity between all these different investigators, um, uh, Zika plans really played a crucial part. Hmm. You, um, and then you also mentioned the, uh, obviously the COVID-19 and the data on that and uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome. And maybe this is a chance to open it to you and, uh, you and to Hugh and to Bart, particularly with this paper that you mentioned that looked at the UK epidemiological data. Um, and those data suggest that GBS, rather than increasing during the pandemic, GBS has gone down overall in the UK. And, um, but of course, that's that's presumably because lots of infectious causes are, are are less prevalent because of all the lockdowns. Do you do you think it's still possible? And this is a question for all of you: Is it still possible that GBS is actually a trigger? Uh, sorry, COVID is a trigger of GBS, even if it's not given us this high epidemiological signal. Or are those cases where we've seen COVID? followed by GBS, is the COVID just a coincidence or could it be a trigger, even if it's not a very big trigger? Who'd like to have a go at that? <laughs> yeah, I think, I, think, I think if it's a trigger, it's a rare trigger, honestly, because I mean, at this time we've had millions and millions of people who've had COVID-19. So even if you, if you would say like uh, the, the, the number of, of Campylobacter cases or the number of CMV cases that might cause GBS have gone down drastically, and still you would expect not to see a decrease, but, but some kind of increase, I think, in incidence of GBS, or at least at least a, a stable uh, um, stable amount of cases. Uh, but I think that at this point, we cannot really exclude that it might be one of these rare, rare causes of the disease, and that some of these cases that have been reported are truly cases that, associ that are associated with GBS. But I don't know what... Um, Dr. Willison thinks and Professor Jake. I think, uh, yes, it, it's uh, Hugh Willison here. I think you've put that very well, um, Sonia. And I, and I think Tom's raised a very important point. And, you know, when is an association high enough to be 
you know, clinically relevant or biologically plausible, uh, I think is a very, almost a philosophical question. One of the things you might highlight, Sonia, is your experience from the IGOS cohort, in which in some cases you've seen dual infections with organisms which are known to trigger uh, GBS. And so I think the assumption that the COVID-19 cases uh, associated with GBS has o have only had COVID-19 and not other triggers as well is a difficult one to be certain about. Mm. Okay, I think uh, if there are no more questions, we probably better keep moving on. Um, but uh, Sonia, thank you for that part. You're welcome. Thank you as well, also for the discussion. Um, I would like to move on to the next speaker, uh, Professor Hugh Willison from Glasgow University. Um, I'm having the privilege of working uh, together with uh, Professor Willison already for a very long time, even when I was a PhD student. Uh, we had a lot of fun and um, I am very uh, honored to present uh, to you, uh, Professor Willison, with an overview on the GBS uh, pathophysiology. Hugh. Yes, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everybody uh, around the world. It's a real pleasure to, to be here today. Um, I was involved um, with Annalise in, 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 in setting up this Zika plan program, as you know, and my brief was to run Work Package 4, which really covers the um, pathophysiology of neuro Zika in its different forms. And um, a lot of people were involved in this, and you're going to hear some of these studies in a few minutes from my co-investigator in the University of Glasgow, Dr. Julia Edgar. I'm really going to stick to some of the sort of science behind um, Guillain-Barre syndrome and what we were looking for uh, within the Zika plan program. And I think as has been alluded to earlier, one of the first things that we really had to try to understand was whether uh, uh, Zika GBS was due to direct infection of the nervous system, of the peripheral nervous system, or wh whether it was a para-infectious or post-infectious autoimmune response. And dealing with Zika, which is such a neurotropic virus, I think it is completely reasonable to understand that it might also infect the peripheral nervous system and thus drive a direct uh, neurotoxicity of peripheral nerve through infection, as well as the possibility of post-infectious autoimmunity. Um, and Julia is going to tell you about some of the direct infection studies that, that, uh, that we conducted uh, later, and I'm going to really stick to this issue of post-infectious autoimmunity as outlined in this wee figure here. And it's a complicated subject because, of course, as we heard uh, from, um, from other speakers, including Sonia, uh, Zika, chikungunya and dengue are all circulating at the same time. And we're not quite clear, you know, whether GBS might be solely driven by one or all of these um, viruses and indeed whether it might be some sort of cooperation between a number of them and um, gathering cohorts of patients um, and clinical samples that are acutely timed in the context of the onset of the disease is also a challenging issue in its own right. Um, the real model that we all think about when we think about Guillain-Barre syndrome, and I've illustrated two uh, known causal infections of Guillain-Barre in this cartoon here, one of them being C. jejigi and the other being uh, Zika virus. So uh, it seems as though an infection drives an antibody uh, and a T cell response to that infection in the immune system in the normal way, but that somehow uh, molecular determinants on the surface of the infection here illustrated for C. jejuni and putatively for uh, components of Zika virus trigger an immune response, which through a process we call molecular mimicry, goes on to um, lead to cross-reactivity with targets in the peripheral nervous system and therefore the onset of diseases like Guillain-Barre syndrome. And this pathway of, uh, of, of, of infection leading to an immune response, which then traffics into peripheral nerve and acts neurotoxically on peripheral nerve is very well established for C. jejuni infection. 
Um, and of course, when we saw uh, Zika GBS, we wondered whether a similar pathway to that that we see with C. jejuni was also arising in, in, in the context of, of Zika GBS. And as Sonia alluded to earlier, one of the first opportunities to look at that really came in 2014 when we were, my laboratory in Glasgow was asked by the Pasteur Institute and their colleagues in French Polynesia to look at the serum samples from these patients um, in the Zika GBS epidemic that occurred in, in French Polynesia at the time. And they had done some preliminary studies looking for the main um, antibody targets that we see in Guillain-Barré syndrome. And these are called gangliosides or glycolipids. And from their preliminary analysis, they had identified some um, autoantibodies to different glycolipids in these populations of uh, Zika GBS patients, which they thought might be relevant. And that's really where we were asked to step in and try and confirm these results and also start investigating wider cohorts. So we've been involved in this for you know at least uh, at least five years, if not uh, if not going on seven or eight. Um, and it has led to the most uh, fantastic collection of collaborations around the world. Um, Receive Fear, Lucia has talked to you about. You've heard a little bit about the NEAS network in Colombia um, uh, that we've been involved with, the French Polynesia. Um, but there are also other groups, for example, in Puerto Rico that we've been involved with as well. And, and, and it has been the most fantastic um, uh, collection of, of researchers and research opportunities in which to address these questions. So we've received samples uh, in our laboratory for looking for this glycolipid antibody signature from pretty much all of these groups. And I'll just share with you a couple of, a couple of things that we found. Now, these may look rather complicated. They're actually much simpler than they appear to be. Uh, and across the top are all the different uh, glycolipids that we've looked at. And down here are all the different clinical groups and each horizontal line going the whole way across is a single patient. So that's about 30 patients there, and that's about half a dozen or so. Um, and, the, and the hot spots in red show an intense antibody activity to a particular target, and the black spots show completely the opposite and the rainbow in between. And these have been sorted using statistical methodology called heat mapping. And um, this is the uh, uh, this is the Carly cohort from the NAAS network, and you can see that uh, in that there's a very wide spread of this type of antibody reactivity to particular targets, which occurs across all the groups, not just the Guillain-Barré groups, but also the the dengue, the Zika convalescent, and acute groups. And, and this is a kind of background uh, reactivity which doesn't segregate with Guillain-Barré syndrome. There was a suggestion that some of the cases might have looked a little bit like the French Polynesian samples, but nothing really jumped out uh, from this cohort uh, 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 at us. And um, we then went on to look at the, um, the cohort from Lucia and from the Recife network. Um, and again, um, it was, a disappointing result in the sense that we didn't find a clear glycolipid antibody signature, but it was an important result in the sense that it was clearly very different from what we might usually see in GBS. And to show you what we might usually see, I'll point you to the Peruvian outbreak, which was this collaboration with Ana Ramos um, uh, through Carlos, um, that Sonia mentioned before. And this is the uh, data from the Peruvian um, GBS outbreak, which was initially possibly suspected to be uh, due to Zika. And you can see that it's completely different because this is the control group here where there is really very little signal indeed. But in the Peruvian GBS cases, you see this massive clustering of, uh, of antibody responses to key 
um, Guillain-Barre driving glycolipids and similarly these groups here and when you add all of these up the sensitivity of this uh, finding is approaching 90 percent so this is an, ex uh, an extremely different kind of heat map from the ones that we're seeing in, um, uh, in Zika GBS um, and what this really telling us is that uh, we know the infectious drivers of Guillain-Barre syndrome uh, vary hugely in different outbreaks around the world. Uh, and in contrast to other types of GBS and particularly uh, C. jejuni GBS, this typical anti-glycolipid antibody signature that we see in, in Campylobacter GBS is not evident in Zika GBS. And in a way this allows us to look uh, when we see an antibody biomarker to a gangliocide, um, it rather suggests that that indeed is not um, due to Zika GBS. And we know that in some of the cohorts that we've looked at of apparent Zika GBS, we have seen this gangliocide antibody signature. And it certainly suggests to me that uh, perhaps those patients also had, for example, a recent Campylobacter infection or another or, or another infection that drives GBS. And, comes back to the point that I raised earlier about multiple infections potentially confounding one's interpretation of these studies. Um, so having not found the key antibody uh, to be a glycolipid, we then went on to start to look for other targets and through collaborations with Simon Rinaldi and Louis Querol uh, in, in Oxford and Barcelona, have been, have been moving this forward. And I'll just share with you finally one slide which Simon Rinaldi sent me from his group, which is really remarkable. And here what they've done is they've taken serum samples from patients with uh, Zika GBS and applied them to living nerves in culture to see whether an, any antibodies in those serum samples might actually bind to peripheral nerve. And you can see that they do. I mean, here's a Zika GBS case uh, where the antibody in the blood is binding to a key part of the nerve at the node of Ronvier, in fact, at the edge of the node of Ronvier called the paranode. And this is a very significant finding indeed. And here's another patient in which the, uh, the, the staining is much more widely distributed, but also includes the nodal gap itself. And when they add, um, complement, which is a lytic uh, blood component to these cultures, um, the whole of the cult, the whole of the myelin in the culture disappears in a way you'd expect to see with Zika GBS, uh, sorry, with uh, uh, in a way you'd expect to see in patients with Guillain-Barre syndrome. And so there is no doubt that some um, Zika GBS cases do harbor neurotoxic antibodies and through different approaches like immunoprecipitation with mass spectrometry, they're pulling down targets, uh, which are shown down here in the bottom right-hand corner, which could be related to the disease uh, as antibody targets and need validating in further studies. So I think that what this um, uh, set of studies has shown us is, is, is that by careful searching, you know, one can find um, autoantibody biomarkers for Zika GBS, which will help in case definition uh, and diagnosis in the future. And it just leaves me to mention uh, a couple of people in my laboratory who run the glycoarray facility, notably Susan Halstead and Dawn Gourlay, who have literally, under Zika plan, examined thousands of, uh, of, of, of samples and, and produced some really interesting data which is in part published and continues to be published and we're also very um, closely networked into the IGOS database and Sue and Dawn have just finished the glycolipid antibody screening now for the for over a thousand patients in the IGOS database much of which has been generated through the fantastic uh, community um, that we have with Zika plan and associated groups so that's all I have to say, and, and, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, you very uh, clear story. Let's give them an applaud. Um, so uh, in the chat box, there's one uh, question from Lida Osario. Um, 
and she asks, uh, what is Zika doing in the CSF? Mm. Well, um, I, I, um, if, if it's uh, sort of thinking two steps ahead and saying, does, do, do I think that that may be in some way driving Zika GBS? Um, I, I don't think so, particularly. That's not, I mean, I, we think of GBS as really being a, a peripheral immune response in a target organ in the periphery or in peripheral lymph nodes that spills over into the, into the nerves um, and into the nerve roots and possibly into the CSF rather than a direct infection. There's no reason why Zika shouldn't penetrate the brain. We know it gets into the the fetal brain, we know it gets into the adult brain. I mean, Tom and colleagues uh, will no doubt tell us about Zika encephalitis. Um, I think even if a patient has Zika GBS, there's no reason why they shouldn't also potentially, as a post-infectious autoimmune disease, there's no reason why they also shouldn't potentially have direct Zika infection of the central nervous system at the same time. Um, so a rather, open question and a rather open answer but if if the questioner wants to ask me something a bit more specifically then i'm happy to have a, a shot at it maybe i can ask you uh, something quite specific so i mean those images from the campylobacter were striking yes and you know the fact we i guess one question is how much would we see that with other uh, causes of gbs like say cmv and then the fact that we're not seeing a pattern with Zika, does that mean that Zika is causing GBS via a range of different approaches? Or does it just mean that we, is it, are there no anti-glycolipid antibodies? Is it antibodies against some other nerve component? You know, how, yeah, how do we make well, sense of it? <laughs> Tom, Tom, as usual, you asked the million dollar question. And um, um, the, you know, we, we just don't know. I mean, in general terms, bacterially driven um, GBS like Haemophilus, Mycoplasma, um, um, uh, Campylobacter, it have been much more strongly associated with anti-glycolipid antibodies and it has been much easier to find them. In contrast, virally driven GBS like Hepatitis E, CMV, uh, Zika, it's been much harder to find the uh, relevant putative autoantibody. Mm. It still could be a glycolipid, but not the normal sort of glycolipid that we think about, but some odd glycolipid, perhaps even one which is human specific. I mean, there are certain glycolipids which really only occur in humans and they're extremely difficult to investigate. It could be a cluster of glycolipids carried in the viral envelope that we haven't been able to sort of re reconstruct, or it could be something completely different like some membrane protein, mm. uh, or it could be nothing to do with direct antibody mediated autoimmunity, but a much more complicated immunological mechanism, which we haven't even thought of. And, uh, and it is true to say those questions are still very open. And I think Zika has really helped us to, you know, illuminate that area. Um, we're running into the, uh, it, we're just about but, uh, butting on coffee, but Annalise has just, she looks like she's just come off the ski slopes and is sitting outside her ski chalet there and, and is going to ask the final question or make the final comment. Yes, well, thank you. Thank you, Tom, and thank you, Hugh. So, so basically, with a, with a not yet well-defined receptor uh, or mediator, uh, there's also no therapeutic option in the moment. Is that, is that a correct conclusion? No. Well, the, the, the first part of what you say is, is correct. The second part is, is a little bit more general than that, and that we treat all Guillain-Barre syndrome rather the same with the presumption that the mechanism, even if the precise molecular receptor isn't known, that the downstream pathways are the same in different patients. And one gets this information from electrophysiology and the clinical course and from various other things. So the treatment is the same as normal Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is um, intravenous immunoglobulin and plasma exchange therapy. And in fact, in Zika GBS, and maybe the clinicians can 
correct me or step in. In fact, most were treated with one of those treatments where it was available, and many of them have done extremely well and recovered very well. So no, I don't think it introduces a kind of nihilistic um, approach to treatment at all. Can I ask a very last question of Bart, our session chair? Um, but we'll have to keep the answer brief, but it's a good question that's come in from the, on the chat. Should we be using anti-ganglicide antibodies uh, as part of the routine testing to help us diagnose GBS, or is our clinical acumen good enough and, and we should just leave these tests for the fascination of Professor Willison and his colleagues? Well, in the, in the short answer, because it's a rather difficult question indeed, I think there, in general, there is not really an added value of testing gangrosite antibodies for the diagnosis of TBS uh, because it is lacking, uh, let's say, sensitivity. And there's a, a big issue with the techniques that are used to test these antibodies and that influence the result, of course. But there's a lot of new developments. Uh, new antibodies are discovered. Uh, and I can imagine that in the future, we will have a kind of set of, of antibodies that uh, is playing a role in the diagnostics. And I think that's already uh, becoming more clear for antibodies to GQ and B, which are highly specific for the Miller Fisher variant of Guillain Barre syndrome. And we are using that test uh, in some clinical uh, situation already. Uh, but more research needs to be done. Okay.